the University of Michigan. Um, and the idea was that uh, some companies had found innovative ways to market multinational goods to the poor, and that this provided a new level of, of service um, to, to the poor and, and enabled them to have access to goods from the rich world. And so this is the example of shampoo and soap, which poor people could never previously afford to buy because it came in big quantities in supermarkets and uh, the, the cost of an average bottle of shampoo is more than what people made in a day. And so arrived these famous soap sachets, um, which now unfortunately litter the fields of rural India and South Asia. And this, I think we've come to believe, is the only way that we can really engage with the poor. We sell them our stuff in smaller packets, ostensibly to make their lives better. But I think that is a little short-sighted. I think engagement is really a two-way street. It's not just about selling stuff to poor people and viewing them as passive consumers, which is only one step better than viewing them as passive recipients of handouts. True engagement requires us to value people who are less fortunate than ourselves as equals. And importantly, to see them as producers, as people capable of making products and services that you and I will actually buy. And there's some precedent for this. This is a picture of Henry Ford's assembly line, um, which did something amazing. It took the production of this highly complex machine, the automobile, and broke it down into small tasks that people with a bit of training could do on an assembly line. And in doing so, he liberated auto manufacturing, which had previously been, um, been taking place in the elite realm of craftsman studios. And he, he showed that it was possible to mass produce the automobile and mass employ a whole class of American workers. And the 20th century saw this thinking apply to every kind of manufacturing. In China and Southeast Asia, sewing machines have empowered millions of women to escape poverty by earning money in garment factories. But the problem is that you can't build a factory like this in most of the places where poor people actually live, so they have to leave their rural hometowns and move to the coast and live in barracks in order to get this kind of employment. And you also need infrastructure. You need ways to bring in raw materials and move finished product out. You need functional roads and waterways. You need grid power. You need equipment to build your factory. You need customs officials who are not going to hold up your order. And to pay for all this, you usually have to create economies of scale and get lots of people working in the same place at once. And so that's how I used to think about jobs for the poor. I used to think, you know, what could we do to, to, to increase this kind of production in poor places and create these, these uh, jobs as part of the global economy for the poor? And uh, then I stumbled into a new kind of work that doesn't have these sorts of infrastructure requirements but is really exciting, and that is digital work. The demand for digital work is huge. Western companies currently send billions of dollars of work through the internet in fields like data entry and image tagging. This is a $1.3 trillion global industry, business process outsourcing, as it's called. And um, generally, the jobs it creates are for middle class people in big cities in the developing world, in centers that look like this one. And it was on the call center floor that I first realized the promise of digital work to bring employment to the bottom bottom four billion. Right after college, four years after I left Ghana, I was shipped off to India to give advice to a firm with 12,000 employees that handled back office work for some major global corporations. And I, I, um, I had become a management consultant after getting a little frustrated with the, the world of global development. And they were like, okay, you're Indian, you've been to the developing world, we're just gonna send you. <laughs> so I showed up and I was supposed to give advice to a CEO on how to run his company at the age of 21. And so instead, what I, what I ended up doing is just walking around and talking to people. And at lunch one day, I met a worker who told me that one of his colleagues lived in Dharavi. Dharavi is South Asia's largest slum. It's in Bombay. It's where Slumdog Millionaire was filmed. And, uh, and this, this colleague of his worked with him as a call center agent. And I had an epiphany then. I thought, the internet is not just an information superhighway. It's a work superhighway. And for the first time in human history, it's possible for a kid from the worst slum in South Asia to earn money by taking calls for British Airways. Tom Friedman wrote a book about this called The World is Flat, and he started highlighting some of the opportunities in this space, but he really focused on, on this kind of a model, building a big center in a place like Bombay that employs thousands of people in one, in one place. And so the infrastructure requirements of the modern factory also apply to a center like this one. And I thought, if the model can work here in urban India, what could I do to take it to the 
rural corners of the world, to the places where poor people actually live. What could it do for rural parts of my own country, like the Mississippi River Delta, one of the poorest parts of America? So I began researching the cost of computers and infrastructure, and I was quite, uh, quite surprised by what I learned. We live in a really exciting time. <coughs> Thanks to Moore's Law, the cost of computing devices is going down dramatically. The number of computers in the world has now reached over a billion. <coughs> Around 200 million laptops and netbooks were sold last year alone. And the newest one, although I don't know if this is actually a real machine because I've only read the press releases and haven't seen one uh, in person, the newest one made by Creation Tech in China reportedly costs $65. So this is the sewing machine of the future. This is what will bring peace work to the next billion people, I believe. And uh, so even if you don't have a very powerful machine, if it's connected to the internet, you can do a whole range of stuff. And uh, speaking of internet connectivity, this is what Africa's telecommunications backbone looked like in 1983. You can see that there's not much going on, particularly on the east side of the continent. And this is what it looks like today. The price for the average Kenyan or Ugandan to get online is supposed to be cut in half this year. We haven't seen all of those uh, all of those cost reductions yet, but a lot of our partners who work in East Africa have reported that the internet is far cheaper than it ever was before. And I really believe that within the next five years, internet connectivity will be ubiquitous, even in the developing world. And if you don't have a link to a fiber optic cable, you can get one of these, a satellite dish. This one is on top of our center in Haiti and shares its space uh, with cook stoves. And the speed at which this kind of connectivity is reaching poor communities is just mind-boggling. Two billion people are on the internet now. Over 500 million of them use Facebook. And if you get enough of these cheap computers and internet connectivity together, and install a generator and connect those machines to the internet, you get this, which I argue is the modern factory, the digital factory. So some of you are probably thinking I'm a little crazy at this point, and that there's no way a center like Cyber Cafe Linda here could compete with a sophisticated digital work firm because of that problem of scale. In a rural part of India or Africa, you can't find 5,000 people to report into one center. And you certainly don't have the infrastructure to support something like that. And the companies that need this, this digital work done, companies like Amazon and Intuit and eBay, they need it done in massive volumes. But that's what's so great about the internet. It's opened up new ways of working within business process outsourcing, which it, within the field of digital work, and made it possible for people to do work on a per-task or micro-work basis. We no longer need everyone in the same factory to achieve the same efficiencies of scale as we see on the factory floor. And as outsourcing matures, we're seeing more and more of this work move into the cloud and enable workers to plug into what we call the virtual assembly line. And these workers can be in rural Iowa, they can be in Indonesia, they can be in sub-Saharan Africa. What the internet does is it reduces the friction of all of these people in, in these far-flung locations. It reduces the friction of them collaborating with each other. And I believe it will facilitate a global meritocracy and enable us to employ a new kind of worker. For a really long time, women, people with disabilities, and those caring for family members didn't have much of a chance to work in the formal sector because they needed more flexible work arrangements that would let them work from home or let them work from their local community. 